Hey, thanks for checking out Lore and Legends. But for this episode, I'm going to add some new information to an older episode. It falls a little into the political realm, okay, a lot into the political realm, but also squarely into the future of humanity realm. Central bank digital currencies is what we're going to talk about, and the old episode that will be attached here is one that was called FedCoin and the Future. Imagine a world where you have no real control over your own income, where you can't buy or sell without the approval of the state. Now, it sounds crazy, but it's right around the corner if we don't start waking up. Canada is a perfect example. And I'm not here to take sides between truckers and the COVID crowd, but it is undeniable that the concept of a government freezing your bank account over as little as $40 donated to political opposition is horrifyingly illiberal and the kind of thing we might expect from countries like Communist China, the former Soviet Union, or Nazi Germany. You may cheer when your political party is in power, as do people in those nations, but what happens when they aren't? Or what happens when your team abandons you, as they ultimately will? Now imagine that going one step further, where the government doesn't even have to exert some unusual or special willpower over a third-party banking industry with the approval of a legislature. Imagine a government in complete and total control of currency, in such a way that they don't even need permission because they own the whole of the system. That is central bank digital currency. Now, it's important to note that these digital currencies of the state are not rebranded versions of blockchains like Bitcoin, or even fiat-backed stablecoins like USDC. These central bank digital coins are like fiat currency on steroids, where they don't even have to physically print cash to cause inflation, or go out of their way to freeze an account, because they hold all the accounts. It sounds like I'm being an alarmist, but here's the truth, and you can read it for yourself. Per the G7's own document on the issue, the CBDCs will virtually eliminate privacy. Every move you make is now accessible, which sure, may in some small, insignificant way stop some crime, but it also makes things like Canada's assault on freedom more terrifying. Now, it will not just be your one-off purchases that are monitored, but it's your entire life's picture. What and who do you subscribe to? Who do you pay and receive money from, and why? How much food did you buy? How much gas did you buy? How much did you spend on clothes or luxury items? Your entire life handed to the government in a never-before-seen way. You may dislike big tech now, but how are you going to feel when it's the worst person you can imagine in your country's government? If you're a modern liberal or someone who is left-wing, how does a Trumpian world make you feel about this situation? If you're a modern conservative or otherwise right-wing person, how does somebody like Trudeau look to you now? It wasn't that long ago, and honestly, is no secret that the American IRS has been used historically to target political opposition. So what now? We're going to make that an even easier and more enticing thing for those in power to do? The G7 document, which I will link to at laurenlegends.net, which you can get to by clicking the link in the episode description, also mentions the idea that the currency could be programmable to meet future needs. What the heck does that mean? It means that even in their own context, the currency could be restricted to authorized uses. And what that means is controlling commerce with an iron fist. Now certainly that probably won't happen overnight, but the capability is there, and that's terrifying. Limiting what you can buy and sell and receive, whether it's food, services, etc. Imagine this new emergency power-soaked western world with the genuine ability to flip a switch and decide from thousands of miles away in the posh offices of plutocrats what is essential in your life. All of this done, of course, in the name of safety and security. The same thing Emperor Palpatine said as he took over the Republic in Star Wars. That old saying stands, the path to hell is paved in good intentions. So if you value the free exchange of ideas, goods, and services, it is now more than ever the time to pay attention. So with that said, what follows is the episode FedCoin in the Future, which, unfortunately, has aged pretty well, and it still stands on its own. No matter how you feel about the current events of today, the truth is, we're all living in legendary times.
So without further ado, here is FedCoin and the Future. This episode might be a little different than what I usually do. There is going to be a little bit of politics mixed in, but hopefully not the left versus right paradigm that you're used to. We're going to be taking a look at the future of freedom in regards to money. So what is money? Money, as you know, is a medium of exchange, and over time, it has taken the form of many different things, from seashells to salt to precious metals coins made of those metals, and eventually, the fiat paper currencies that we have today. It's a step above the barter system. Money, as we understand it, enables you to trade with people for goods and services, independent of what you might personally be able to barter with based on your available resources or skill set. You might even say it's been a liberating force in human history. That's not to say money doesn't come with baggage. But on the whole, consider that money allowed us to agree on the value of an apple, time spent working on a project, or the value of being entertained for a while. It's a huge step in the direction of a less dangerous and more equal society. But what happens when the money you have in your pocket or in your bank isn't really yours anymore? What happens when the value can be determined arbitrarily by a third party that isn't actually taking part in your exchange with another person? Well, welcome to our current world of fiat currency, inflation, and taxes. You could think of it like you would normally think about supply and demand. More money is printed, so it is more readily available to be dispersed. This lowers the value of any one dollar. In the U.S., we manage right around 2% inflation most years. If you have a savings account, go look at your interest rate. Odds are it's below 1%. So you're actually losing purchasing power every year just by letting your money sit. Now, contrast that to something like gold. Compared to fiat currency, gold is a much more stable store of value. Gold recently hit a whopping $2,000 per ounce as people seek the financial safety it historically offers. In fact, for a long time, gold was the standard of money. And at one point, you could even exchange your U.S. dollar for a bit of gold. But that's a history lesson for another time. I'll leave some links about that over at lorenlegends.net. But part of gold's recent boom is the fear of inflation brought on by years and years of massive deficit spending by the U.S. government. But you don't really feel inflation in the same way you feel a tax, though the end result is still your money trickling ever upwards. Year over year, you probably don't even think about it. Think about it over time. $1 in 1970 is about $6.64 today. That's a rate of inflation of about 564%. Or otherwise stated, 564% of your $19.70 has been confiscated. That's one way your freedom is impacted. Unless you hold a lot of in-demand assets that benefit from inflation or strike it rich in the stock market, you're left with less and less purchasing power and less incentive and less ability in the big picture to save money for a rainy day. The odds are stacked against the average user. So what is the answer to this? Returning to gold? Maybe. Search the web for Peter Schiff gold money. But maybe a better idea is the idea of cryptocurrency. Now everyone's heard of Bitcoin, but you must also realize there are now thousands of different cryptocurrencies, each offering something a little bit different. But what makes the idea of crypto special in regards to money? Well, for one, it's decentralized and generally finite. There will only be a grand total of 21 million bitcoins that are ever mined into existence. So more money can't simply be produced on a whim. Bitcoin also has the ability to be infinitely fractionalized. So even if one person did somehow manage to buy up most of the bitcoin, the rest of the world could, in theory, operate with the remaining 1%. But Bitcoin isn't the only crypto, so it's not like you'd be stuck. And of course, there are cryptocurrency exchanges where you can trade one for another. It's not really so different than markets that buy and sell foreign currencies today in an attempt to earn an extra buck here and there. The other benefit of crypto 
is that it can be anonymous. It's truly yours. Governments fear this, and in many places do or have attempted to treat it as property. And in collapsed countries like Venezuela, Bitcoin became a way to escape increasingly worthless through inflation currency, and a way to send money between families without having to go through failing, expensive, or corrupted banks. This is not to say cryptocurrencies are without any issues. By all means, they are still in their historical infancy. There has been theft, and of course the mainstream will propagate horror stories of crime and trafficking as if those things don't already happen with paper money. So why did I call this episode FedCoin and the Future? Well, I'm going to read to you an article written July 28th of this year by the former head of the House of Representatives Banking Committee and a longtime champion of liberty, Ron Paul. It was titled, FedCoin, A New Scheme for Tyranny and Poverty. Quote, If some Congress members get their way, the Federal Reserve may soon be able to track many of your purchases in real time and share that information with government agencies. This is just one of the problems with the proposed digital dollar, or FedCoin. FedCoin was initially included in the first coronavirus spending bill, while the proposal was dropped from the final version of the bill, there is still great interest in FedCoin on Capitol Hill. Some progressives have embraced FedCoin as a way to provide Americans with a universal basic income. Both the Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services Committee held hearings on FedCoin in June. This is the first step towards making FedCoin a reality. FedCoin would not be an actual coin. Instead, it would be a special account created and maintained for each American by the Federal Reserve. Each month, Fed employees could tap a few keys on a computer and, bingo, each American would have dollars added to his Federal Reserve account. This is the 21st century equivalent of throwing money from helicopters. FedCoin could affect private cryptocurrencies. Also, it would limit the ability of private citizens to protect themselves from the Federal Reserve cause decline in the dollar's value. FedCoin would not magically increase the number of available goods and services. What it would do is drive up prices. The damage this would do to middle and lower income Americans would dwarf any benefit they receive from their monthly gift from the Fed. The rise in prices could lead to Congress regularly increasing FedCoin payments to Americans. These increases would cause prices to keep rising even more until we face hyperinflation and a dollar crisis. Of course, we are already on the path to an economic crisis thanks to the Fed. FedCoin will hasten and worsen the crisis. FedCoin poses a great threat to privacy. The Federal Reserve could know when FedCoin is used, who is using it, and what they're using it for. This information could be shared with government agencies, such as the FBI or the IRS. The government could use the ability to know how Americans are spending FedCoin to limit our ability to purchase goods and services, disfavored by politicians and bureaucrats. Anyone who doubts this should recall the Obama administration's Operation Choke Point. Operation Choke Point involved financial regulators alerting banks that dealing with certain businesses, such as gun stores, would put the banks at a reputational risk and could subject them to greater regulation. Is it so hard to believe that the ability to track purchases would be used in the future to discourage individuals from buying things like guns, fatty foods, or tobacco, or from being customers of corporations whose CEOs are not considered woke by the thought police? FedCoin could also be used to encourage individuals to patronize green businesses, thus fulfilling Fed Chair Jeremy Powell's goal of getting the Fed in the fight against climate change. FedCoin could threaten private cryptocurrencies, increase inflation, and give government new powers over our financial transactions. FedCoin will also speed up destruction of the fiat money system. Whatever gain FedCoin may bring to the average Americans will come at a terrible cost to liberty and prosperity. End quote. Left, right, or indifferent, can you see where this is headed? If a government has that level of control on the currency then they control the on and off switch to whatever it is that that control is sought over. You won't be able to pay someone cash for a side job or a garage sale item without the feds knowing what it is you're doing and with whom. It's an invasion of privacy and a serious threat to your rights. It would be easier for the feds and the well-connected to promote certain ventures and discourage others. 
all the downfalls of fiat currency will still exist, but they'll be even easier to manipulate. I think a digital dollar is inevitable, but who's behind it? That will matter and should be something to think about seriously. And that goes double, because the creatures in Congress sought to ram this through, hidden in an ill-planned reactionary bill meant to help people with the fallout of COVID-19, which tends to be the way most terrible things become laws. Lore? Legend? Of the future? Yes, I think so. We're at a point in history that is going to be written about, and we should be paying attention to the things we set up for the future. People might wonder why and how. Just look at all the shadows surrounding the idea of central banking across the world. The American Federal Reserve has quite a history of its own. Check out a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. There's also no shortage of conspiracy theory about past and present wars and their relationship to money and mega commodities like oil. Or how about religion and the ideas of one world currencies and the end times? And we've been hearing a lot about George Orwell's 1984, given the recent world circumstances. But did you know that in Orwell's 1984, at least the main character was able to still use cash to go buy a book? Now it seems, in the real 1984, you might not even be able to do that. Should the future of freedom be beholden to reactionary crisis politics? I don't think so. And if you've never thought about this, hopefully this gets you thinking. And I hope you feel the same as I do. Be sure to click the link to loreandlegends.net listed in the episode description for more detailed show notes and some extra commentary on this episode. But that's all I had for this episode. See you next time.